Welcome to the Blink 2, Alain de Botton's How Proust Can Change Your Life. I'm Brian Dozy, your narrator. So if you haven't heard of Marcel Proust, the French author, this Blink is the perfect introduction. If you've been meaning to read Proust but haven't had the time, this Blink may give you that little extra push that you've been needing. And if you have no intention of ever reading Proust, that's fine, but you can still benefit from the delightful life lessons to be learned from Proust's masterpiece In Search of Lost Time, which was published in 1913. Alain de Botton is a British-Swiss philosopher, and How Proust Can Change Your Life is a quirky blend of literary self-help and biography of Proust, which was published in 1997. It shows how Proust offers guidance to almost every conceivable problem you may have, no matter what time you're living in. Now, this blink really only has one key message. Read Proust. Because, as you're about to find out, he's not just a literary master. He can, really, change your life. Chapter 1. Reading is Therapeutic. This is the first chapter out of five. Marcel Proust's seven-volume novel, In Search of Lost Time, follows its narrator, also named Marcel, it's not confusing at all, as he remembers his life, from early childhood to imminent death, in aristocratic 19th-century France. Critics and readers alike have hailed In Search of Lost Time as a work of genius. But the critic whose approval Proust most desired died four years before the first volume was published in 1913. That critic was his father, Dr. Adrien Proust. Adrien Proust was a physician and a medical professor. Like his son, his literary output was prodigious, though the 34 books the elder Proust wrote were on dry medical topics like disease transmission. The younger Proust often worried that he was a disappointment to his father. Marcel tried and failed to settle on a respectable career. He lasted barely two weeks working in a solicitor's office, he eschewed a diplomatic career because he couldn't bear to leave Paris, and he quit his post at a library because the books were too dusty. The truth was, all Marcel wanted to do, much to Adrien's chagrin, was write. What's more, the younger Proust thought literature was just as important in its own way as medicine. Marcel believed reading fiction had a therapeutic power, now, Dr. Proust would almost certainly have dismissed his son's claim. A novel can offer escapism on a long train ride. It can't diagnose a case of tuberculosis or perform an appendectomy. Now, Proust Sr. may be right. A novel can't perform surgery, but it does have therapeutic power. At least, so argues Alain de Botton. So, what are some of the therapeutic benefits to reading Proust? Well, reading Proust will help you feel at home in works of art. When Proust looked at paintings, he didn't stop at admiring their composition or the artist's use of color. He habitually matched the people on the canvas with people from his own life. A friend recalled him studying a portrait of an elderly man by the Renaissance painter Ghirlandaio, painted in 1480, and remarking on its likeness to a well-known contemporary aristocrat, the Marquis de Lau. Whether he was reading the latest novel or gazing at a 400-year-old painting, Proust felt at home in works of art, because he was alive to the ways in which they paralleled his own life. When you immerse yourself in Proust, you might begin to develop this habit too. In Search of Lost Time is populated with the aristocrats, artists, socialites, workers, and peasants of Belle Epoque, France. At first, their manners might seem remote, their concerns irrelevant to you. But persist, and you will soon find points of resonance between their lives and yours. Persist long enough, and you will learn to see these resonances in other artworks too. A whole world of culture, from Homer's ancient epic poems to cutting-edge contemporary performance art, will throw its doors open to you. Reading Proust will also make you less lonely. In the same way that an intense engagement with In Search of Lost Time will allow you to perceive similarities between your world and Proust's, 
you will learn to find comfort in the experiences you share with his characters. Every day, we're liable to experience emotions and impulses that range from the exquisite to the excruciating. How many of the people around us are privy to the full range of our feelings? And how attuned are we to the emotions and thoughts of those around us? If you're simmering with resentment over a long-ago fight or are occasionally gripped out of the blue with a keen awareness of your own mortality, do you express these feelings to your colleagues or your neighbors, your dentist? Likely not. This can leave you feeling alone and isolated, as though you're the only person who has ever felt or behaved in this specific way. The beauty of the novel is that it potentially offers a window onto the deepest, most intimate thoughts and feelings of a whole spectrum of characters. In Search of Lost Time realizes that potential on a grand scale. If you've ever felt alone in a thought or a feeling, in the pages of Proust, you are certain to meet someone who has shared it. And finally, when you read Proust, you will learn more about yourself. Proust himself expressed this idea simplest and best when he wrote, In reality, every reader is, when he is reading, reading his own self. So, to engage in some self-reading of your own, why not try picking up the first volume of In Search of Lost Time and meeting Marcel in its pages? Chapter 2. Slowing Down Our Reading Teaches Us to Savor Life there's a reason people don't read Proust. Even people who will happily make their way through other canonically classic novels like Great Expectations or Anna Karenina. It's long. The Penguin Clothbound Classics Edition is, in total, 3,444 pages long. And those 3,444 pages aren't exactly filled with short, snappy sentences. In fact, in Volume 5, there's a sentence so long it could wrap around the base of a wine bottle 17 times. In Search of Lost Time even inspired a Monty Python sketch called All England Summarize Proust Competition. In the sketch, each contestant has 15 seconds to summarize all seven volumes, a comically impossible task. But here's the thing. The reason most people cite for not reading Proust is exactly the reason you should try reading Proust. You should read In Search of Lost Time because it's really, 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 really long. These days, we prize speed and efficiency over slow contemplation. We listen to podcasts at 1.5 speed. We strive to answer emails within seconds. And we read the news in tweets of 280 characters or fewer. And, of course, rather than listening to or reading books, we listen to and read blinks. Now, we know we should slow down, at least some of the time, but slowing down is hard. Proust forces his reader to slow down. After all, it's hard to speed read a sentence that could wrap around a wine bottle 17 times. By favoring length, Proust creates space for nuance, shades of gray, contradictions, and complications. He was famously irritated by the news in brief section of the newspaper, where stories were summed up in a sentence or two. For instance, disgruntled wife murders husband, factory worker electrocuted on the job. They never contained enough information to satisfy him. These snippets flattened real people into stereotypes, obscured their motivations, and, worst of all in Proust's eyes, discouraged empathy in the reader. In Search of Lost Time is a corrective to the news items that so bothered Proust. Even the most minor characters are richly drawn and multifaceted. Encountering the empathy with which Proust treats his characters is a lesson in exercising our own empathic muscles. There's another reason In Search of Lost Time is so long. Within its pages, Proust tries to render life with complete freshness, free from cliched description. Around the same time Proust was writing In Search of Lost Time, a group of artists known as the Impressionists was making waves in the French art world. Now, these days we recognize blotchy canvases of lakes and harbors and sunrises by artists like Claude Monet as masterpieces, but at the time, they were widely reviled. They weren't realistic, ran the complaint. Those blurry blue and pink daubs of oil paint were hardly an accurate representation of a lily pond. 
but Proust knew just what the Impressionists were up to. It's no coincidence that one of his novel's most sympathetic characters, Elster, is a fictional Impressionist painter. The Impressionists weren't trying to capture a photorealistic image of a lily pond. They were trying to capture a way of seeing that lily pond, one that was true to the viewer's experience, if not to the pond's exact contours. And Proust was trying to do just the same in his literary work. He didn't want to use tired clichés. He didn't want to write phrases like the silvery moon in a rush to get to the next plot point. Instead, he describes the moon like this. Okay, this is a quote. Sometimes in the afternoon sky, a white moon would creep up like a little cloud, furtive, without display, suggesting an actress who does not have to come on for a while and so goes in front in her ordinary clothes to watch the rest of the company for a moment, but keeps in the background, not wishing to draw attention to herself. End quote. Like the Impressionists, Proust wants us to think in new ways about things we see and experience, things like that late afternoon moon. If it took a few extra words here and there, or quite a few, well, Proust was fine with that. Chapter 3 of 5 Proust reminds us to not take love for granted. The narrator of In Search of Lost Time spends a lot of time strolling around the countryside, attending dinner parties, and trying to get to sleep. In fact, the novel famously opens with a meandering 17-page description of his struggle with insomnia. But in the thousands of pages of the novel, he never finds lasting love. Other relationships depicted in the book aren't exactly aspirational either. A great deal of ink is spilled describing one of literature's nastiest marriages, that between the shallow-in-love Charles Swan and his philandering wife, Odette. As for Proust himself, apart from the fact that he was gay in a time and place where homosexuality was deemed socially unacceptable, we know very little of his romantic life. Does that mean Proust has nothing to teach about love? Perhaps not directly. Indirectly, on the other hand, he has plenty to say on the topic, beginning with his narrator's early encounter with Gilbert. As a boy... Marcel, the narrator, spies Gilbert playing in the Champs-Élysées. He is instantly fascinated. He dreams in loving detail of becoming her friend, of having tea in her apartment. And then his dreams become reality. Gilbert invites Marcel to afternoon tea. Marcel spends the first 15 minutes entranced, but as Gilbert pours tea and slices cake... Marcel is struck by the growing realization that, while Gilbert is wonderful, the Gilbert of his imagination was more wonderful still. What's the lesson here? People, in reality, rarely live up to our idealized versions of them. Moreover, it's difficult to appreciate someone wholly or love them with unvarying intensity over a sustained period of time. Conversely, any expectations we have that our romantic partners should or even could consistently and passionately appreciate us are certainly unrealistic. Familiarity, Proust argues, can dissipate even the most heated passions. In fact, this idea is a recurring motif in Proust's life and work. Writing about the advent of the telephone, Proust observes how quickly something can move from a dazzling invention to an everyday object. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876. By 1907, Proust described the telephone as a supernatural instrument before whose miracle we used to stand amazed, and which we now employ without giving a thought to summon our tailor or to order an ice cream. In Proust's world, everything from love to telephones loses its magic with familiarity and time. Does that mean lasting love is out of reach? Not exactly. Proust had, to put it very mildly, poor health. His ailments ranged from asthma and indigestion to a debilitating phobia of mice. And as a result, he was often bedridden. Once, while in bed, he began to think about Noah from the biblical story. Perhaps hidden away from the world, he was feeling a little like Noah, adrift on his ark. 
At first, Proust pities Noah, who is so isolated from land. But soon Proust grows to think that Noah, surrounded by water, must appreciate land more than anyone else on earth. He must imagine the bushes and mountains and trees of his homeland so vividly that, in a way, he sees them with far more accuracy in his ark than he ever would have on land. No one, Proust imagines, could love their home more than Noah does. Through Noah, Proust suggests that even something which has become tediously familiar becomes precious when we are deprived of it. Of course, in a long-term relationship, it's simply not feasible to, like Noah, sail away from your partner on an ark and stay away for 40 days and nights. But you can create an ark of your own. For Proust, a day or two ill in bed only sharpened his appetite to go out and see friends. Whether it's a night away or a day spent out of contact, depriving yourself of your partner, even momentarily, affords you a chance to be dazzled by them anew. Chapter 4 Looking at the world through an artist's perspective helps us see beauty in the ordinary. In an unpublished essay, Proust imagines a gloomy young man sitting in his parents' Parisian apartment. The remains of lunch are on the table. His mother knits in one corner. A cat curls on top of a cupboard. The young man is gloomy because he is an esthete, obsessed with great art, fine food, inspiring landscapes. Yet he doesn't have the funds to purchase great art, dine on fine food, or travel to inspiring landscapes. How can the young man overcome this dissatisfaction? Proust suggests a visit to the Louvre. But not, as you might think, to vicariously experience the Venetian canals or Greek temples depicted on some of the canvases there. Instead, he directs the man to seek out the work of the French painter Jean-Baptiste Chardin. Chardin's subject matter wasn't grand, but domestic. He painted workers, housewives, middle-class families. His still-life canvases are simple arrangements of things like bread, fruit, fish, coffee pots, and salt cellars. Why, when the young man longed for a world beyond his reach, would Proust send him to examine these ordinary scenes? Because Chardin painted the world the young man lived in. What's more, he made it look extraordinary. While art can unfold extraordinary scenes before us, in Proust's view, it has a more vital role, to surface the magic in ordinary scenes. When art enchants the everyday, it invites us to take a second look at our own lives and appreciate the beauty that surrounds us. Proust signs off the essay by explaining to this young man, when you walk around a kitchen, you will say to yourself, this is interesting, this is grand, this is beautiful, like a Chardin. Another disconsolate young man appears in the pages of In Search of Lost Time, the narrator, Marcel. Like the young man in the essay, he sits at home, bored and unhappy with the monotony of his bourgeois existence. But everything changes when his mother brings him a tray of afternoon tea. On the tray sits a now-famous pastry. It is a sponge cake, fluted like a seashell. It is, of course, a madeleine. Marcel bites into it, and his life changes. Not because of the taste, exactly. At the turn of the 20th century, Parisian patisseries offered sweet treats far more indulgent and elaborate than the simple madeleine. Rather, because it recalls exactly the madeleines Marcel's Aunt Leonie used to feed him when he was a child, staying with her in the village of Cambrai. All at once, he is transported back to the tastes, sights, and sounds of his childhood. Cue thousands of pages of Marcel's musings and remembrances. But the Madeleine doesn't just recall Marcel's childhood. It does something far more powerful. Minutes ago, as Marcel sat contemplating his life's trajectory, his existence had seemed dull and dreary. Now his childhood strikes him as a far more idyllic period than he remembered. The Madeleine had re-enchanted Marcel's own recollections of his life, transforming it from dull to enchanting. So what if you want to re-enchant your life? Should you wait until you encounter your own version of the Madeleine, whatever that may be? Well, you could, but you might be waiting a while. 
At another point in the book, the now adolescent Marcel visits a seaside resort. Before he arrives, he is all anticipation. He imagines a romantically atmospheric setting, stark cliffs, dark ocean, brooding clouds. He is, in a prototypical Instagram versus reality situation, disappointed to find a fairly run-of-the-mill seaside town. The gap between Marcel's expectations and the town's reality threatens to ruin his holiday. Luckily, he meets Elster. Remember him? The fictional impressionist artist. Elster invites Marcel to his studio. And there, Marcel marvels at Elster's depictions of fishing boats shrouded in dawn clouds and village women sitting like mermaids on seaside rocks. Elster has found the beauty in the surroundings. And looking at Elster's perspective, Marcel begins to perceive that beauty too. Proust knows that ordinary life can be magical. A humble Madeleine can be as exquisite as a three-course meal in Paris's best restaurant. But here's the thing. He doesn't expect you to one day wake up and spontaneously see beauty all around you. He doesn't even expect that you will one day be offered a Madeleine, or whatever your Madeleine equivalent may be, that will jolt you into a new appreciation of your life. But he does believe that you can come by that appreciation through careful study of artists who have made it their life's project to illuminate the extraordinary within the ordinary. Artists like Chardin and Elster and, of course, Proust himself. Chapter 5, our final chapter. Proust has advice for nearly every occasion. So if you're hungry for more advice from Proust, you are in luck. He was liberal with his ideas and opinions. So I'll leave you with a few more of Marcel Proust's instructions for living. Here we go. Insomnia is, for some of us, unfortunately, unavoidable. But it's not without its merits. Here's a quote from Proust. A little insomnia is not without its value in making us appreciate sleep, in throwing a light upon that darkness. Okay, next piece of advice. With a little imagination, anything makes for good reading material. Proust reached his early 20s without having read Dostoevsky or Dickens, reading gaps which he later redressed, and was known to favor the French regional train timetable as bedtime reading. He was reported to find this pamphlet as evocative as any novel on provincial French life. Next bit of advice. Intellectual snobbery is to be avoided. And besides... The fact that you share a favorite Tolstoy novel with someone doesn't mean they're good friendship material. In fact, when Proust met James Joyce, the two men found very little to say to each other. And when Proust was asked whether he considered his friends his intellectual peers, he retorted, here's a quote, I do my intellectual work within myself, and once with other people, it's more or less irrelevant to me that they're intelligent as long as they're kind. Next bit of advice. When it comes to dating, playing hard to get is a fail-safe strategy. Here's a quote from Proust. There is no doubt that a person's charms are less frequently a cause of love than a remark such as, No, this evening I shan't be free. Okay, next bit of advice. There's a simple hack that will ensure you get the most out of any dinner party you host. Proust made a habit of moving around the table with each course, eating his soup while conversing with one guest and finishing his fish while conversing with another. As a friend of Proust's recalled, one can imagine that by the fruit he had gone all the way around. Next bit of advice. Doctors and the medical establishment in general are an unfortunate necessity. Here's what Proust had to say. To believe in medicine would be the height of folly. If not to believe in it, we're not a greater folly still. Second to last piece of advice. If you want to win friends and influence people, do as Proust did and ask more questions than you answer. Friends remember him drawing out his conversational partners on all kinds of topics, up to and including the correct maintenance of motor cars. He was, says one friend, the best of listeners. Okay, final piece of advice. When all else fails, there are always books. Here's one last quote from Proust. In reading, friendship is suddenly brought back to its original purity. 
There is no false amiability with books. If we spend an evening with these friends, it is because we genuinely want to.